Good morning, everyone. Welcome to East White Oak Bible Church, where we are seeking to be worshipers maturing in Christ. We're just glad to be here together to think about 
an amazingly wonderful topic. The topic is love, what it's not, what it is, what it does. And to kind of get our hearts wrapped around that, prepare our hearts for worship this morning, I want to share some verses with you that I would call the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, okay? The John 3.16 of the Old Testament. If you ever go to a, a Jewish home or even Jewish buildings uh, in Israel, you would see these little boxes on the doorposts. And, um, in, and you'll see people that they will kiss the, their lips and then touch the box. And if you were to pry open that box, don't do that, but if you were to pry open that box, you would see that there's a little slip of paper in it where in Hebrew are written the words that I'm about to read to you. It's the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. This is, what the, this is what the Word of God says. Hear, <clears throat> O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Let's pray. Teach us, O God, today what it means that you love us and what it means for us to love you and love others. Open our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit to understand and apply your truth. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Would you stand as we begin our, our worship and song this morning by singing, Come People of the Risen King.
Well, as we go to prayer, there's several things I want to share with you. Um, first, some, uh, some of the harder things for us to be praying about. Uh, Pastor Walt's brother, Roger, died suddenly this past week. He and Penny are, Walt and Penny, are in Minnesota uh, taking care of a number of details, including the care of Walt's father. I would encourage you to be praying for Walt and Penny as they seek to uh, both mourn the loss of Walt's brother as well as uh, settle a, a variety of details there. Um, Walt, in pretty quick succession here, has uh, seen his uh, uh, mother and then his sister and now his brother uh, die, so we just want to be praying for our brother there. And then Nell Rawl, uh, who has been a member of our church here for many years, in fact, she became a member of our church on the first Sunday I was here at East White Oak. Uh, she went to be with the Lord this week, and I had such a treasured conversation with her on Thursday. Uh, it was a real sweet thing. One of the questions she asked me was, tell me what went on during your morning this week. What, ha what did you do this morning? And to think here a person was dying and their thinking in a very others-oriented way was really sweet. And I, I won't go into the details, but I told her something that happened that week 
that, or that day that just tickled her so much, she just started laughing. And my memory forever of Nell will be of her sitting in that hospital bed just laughing so sweetly over this silly thing that had happened to me that morning. So, but we want to pray for her daughter, uh, Janet. And aren't we glad of the promises of Scripture that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, that our suffering is over and we are in the presence of God and will enjoy Him forever. What a, what a blessing. Uh, be praying for our team that's returning from Hungary. They'll be re returning late this evening, so would encourage you to be praying for them. I think they've had a really great trip. We'll look forward to hearing from them. And then Doug and Sarah Johnson, our missionaries with Kids Alive International in Guatemala, are here with us. They're actually in an ABF right now over here in the foyer room 126. But if you would like to greet them, we have set up an area in room 172 immediately after the second service where you'll be able to say hi to them and greet them. So would encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity to meet up with one of our missionary couples. Um, as many of you know, we're in the process of doing some refreshing around here, and the refreshing of this room is going to be happening this summer. To that end, there are these cards where you can fill out an amount that you would like to give before the end of the year to that project. Those cards are available in the long hallway, and there's just two more Sundays for you to do that. To this point, we've received around $75,000 in uh, gifts, as well as $75,000 in these uh, pledges. Nobody's asking your name. We're just trying to figure this out on a corporate basis so we know how to plan, but we would encourage you to uh, take advantage of that before um, May 28th, which will be the last Sunday that we do that. So today and next week are the times for that. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Now, Lord, we recognize that we're in need of Your love because we're broken. We have run away from You in things that we do and things we fail to do. So we plead once again the blood of Your Son, Jesus Christ, to forgive us of our sins. And <clears throat> Lord, would You empower us both to love You and to love others? We're going to be praying that several times here in these moments, and we want to, you to know we're serious about that. Now, Lord, we pray for those in our church family who are going through hard things, and particularly today, we want to pray for Pastor Walt and Penny and their family as they mourn the loss of Walt's brother. We pray for Walt's sister-in-law, Carrie, as she has had this sudden loss of her husband, please encourage her and bless her. We pray for Walt's dad, Dale, and ask that you would be very near to him in the midst of this really uh, sudden and difficult loss. And please bless Walt and Penny in this whole thing. Help them to know how to encourage the family, and may they be encouraged themselves from your wonderful bounty. Uh, we pray that the funeral on Tuesday would bring great glory to You. Now, Lord, we want to thank You for Nell and the ministry she had here and the blessing that she has been to us. We'd ask, Lord, that You would watch over her daughter, Janet, and are thankful for Nell's life and the encouraging ways that she uh, brought to our fellowship. We thank You that she's now with you forever because she put her faith in Christ alone to forgive her of her sins. We do pray for the team that's returning from Hungary and ask that you would bless them in their travels. And God, I want to pray especially that you would providentially protect them from some of the things that happen when you've returned from a long trip. Things like your car breaking down or your freezer stopping or any of those kind of crazy things that sometimes happen, it seems, when you've been really putting yourself out for the kingdom of God. 
would you providentially protect them from those kinds of things and just make their transition back to life here in the U.S., uh, one that really goes well. We thank you for Doug and Sarah and ask your blessing upon their ministry uh, in Guatemala and their ministry to us today. And we pray that we'd be able to encourage them uh, in, this, uh, in this day that they're with us. We do pray for the refresh of this room and ask that you would grant favor in that whole process and in every detail of it. We're thankful, God, that you give us clear instructions in your Word. And today, as we look at this great chapter of the Bible about love, I pray that we would be able not just to understand it, but that you would help us to just know how we can put it into practice. First, to understand and comprehend your love, your love for us, and then to be able to have that kind of love for you back. We love because you first loved us. And then that we would be able to love others, both in the church and outside of it, in the same kind of way that you love us. Teach us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, we ask today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Scott has an expression you've probably heard him say before. We've done things this week we shouldn't have done, and, we left, and we've left undone things this week we should have done, which should only serve to remind us of how much we need our Savior. Would you stand and sing with us, please?
still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every February 14th, 1980, and I was sitting in an Arby's restaurant in South Bend, Indiana. I had my Bible and an Arby's Jamocha shake, which remains one of my favorite beverages, although most of the time at Arby's the shake machine is not working. It was working that night, <clears throat> and I sat there with my Bible knowing that in a few short hours my uh, girlfriend at the time, Carol, would be getting off work at the Northern Indiana State Hospital, which was just next to the campus of the University of Notre Dame. It's no longer there, but that's where it was. And she was going to get off work at about 11.30 in the evening, which was not a time that she anticipated meeting up with me. But that night, I was going to ask her to marry me. And so I opened my Bible to 1 Corinthians 13, and in that Arby's restaurant, I spent a couple of hours looking at this text and thinking about the question I was about to pop and what I meant when I said that I loved Carol. Uh, We ended up, uh, I met her outside the hospital there, and she's like, well, Scott, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I had to see my girl on Valentine's Day. And so she got in my car, and we drove to a nearby park where I uh, proceeded to hand her a, a big box that was wrapped. 
She unwrapped it and opened the box, which led to another box, which led to another box, which led to another box, to a small jewelry box. And she kind of, with a little bit of trembling hands, she, she kind of opened it a little bit. And as she did so, I said, Carol, will you marry me? And she replied, oh, Scott. And at that moment, I didn't know whether O. Scott meant, O. Scott, yes, yes, a thousand times yes, or if it meant, O. Scott, you have completely misinterpreted our relationship. <laughs> I found out pretty quickly that O. Scott meant yes, and uh, then I proceeded to share with her 1 Corinthians 13, 7, which uh, I won't, uh, we'll read it in the ESV today, but I actually shared it with her in the New International Version, which was this, love always protects, and I mentioned to her that she was a person of adventure, and I wanted her to go on adventures and to accomplish great things for Christ, but I was going to be one who would protect her look after her and see to it that she not kill herself in the process. No, I didn't say that. Love always trusts. I would always believe the best in her. And love always hopes. I would have aspirations for her and the glory of God to be evidenced in her life, not mine. And love always perseveres that there's going to be, which we don't know what they're going to be, but there's going to be hard things that will come, and I am committing to persevering through all those things together. This morning, as we come to this chapter, I couldn't help but think about that moment, and it was such a treasured, beautiful, romantic moment until the flashing lights of Mishawaka, Indiana's finest were shining in my rearview mirror, and a policeman came to the window and asked to see my license and registration, and so I dutifully pulled it out and gave it to him, and he says, do you still live in Napanee, Indiana? And I said, yes, I do, and he says, well, you're in Mishawaka right now, and our parks close at whatever time, he said, I don't remember now. And, but we were well past that. And he said, so you're going to have to move on. And so he left in his car, went to go back to his car, and uh, wasn't going to ticket me. And Carol says, get his name. He's part of our story. And I said, he's letting us go. We're not going to talk to him anymore. <laughs> so that was how that ended, you know. <laughs> I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians 13. Now, when we were in chapter 11 talking about women's head coverings, one of the challenges of preaching expositionally through the Bible is that you come to passages that aren't preached that often, right? And probably hadn't maybe ever heard a sermon from there. But now we come to a passage that you may have heard Many, if you've been a Christian for a while, you may have heard scores, perhaps even as many as a hundred messages on this, and if you go to weddings, it's a very common text that's preached at at weddings. Uh, This is, of course, what's called the love chapter. Why don't we stand for the reading of God's Word this morning, and we'll read this chapter. Paul has ended chapter 12 by saying, I will show you a still more excellent way. What he's been saying is that there are such things as spiritual gifts, and now he's just going to talk about virtues in general. Some of them are spiritual gifts, but there's virtues like faith and hope and love, and particularly the virtue of love is a more excellent way than even the virtues of really powerful spiritual gifts, that there is a more excellent virtue than even all of those. And here's how he describes it, 1 Corinthians 13, 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, 
but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith hope and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Please have a seat. Jesus had declared that the two greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that in order for the world to know that we are His followers, they would know that by our love for one another. Paul in Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no one anything except the debt to love him or her. Transforming love, enduring love, convicting love, this is what the Bible is talking about when it says the word love. It's not just a feeling it's not an emotion. It's not a concept in isolation from the object of our love. It's not based on mutual attraction. In fact, biblical love overcomes feelings of repulsion, division, and even hostility. There's no expiration date on biblical love. In 1 John, John says, God is love. And love abides, that is, it lasts forever, because God is an eternal God. So let's think about these first three verses where Paul has dis been discussing in chapter 12 the spiritual virtues of spiritual gifts and how God gives these spiritual gifts to each person in the body for the building up of the body, not for that person's uh, self-improvement, but rather the spiritual gifts are given for the building up of the body of Christ. And now he says, I want to show you a more excellent way because all of these spiritual virtues that he's just been talking about, they are meaningless if there isn't love. Emotional and spiritual eloquence are hollow without love. Notice, if I speak in the tongues of men, if I spoke no, the known languages of the world, if I speak in the tongues of angels, perhaps they are unknown languages or the languages known only to angels. Either way, if we speak with those and do not have love, it's just blah, blah, blah. When I was a student at the University of Illinois, I took a course in metallurgical thermodynamics. The topic alone should put you to sleep, okay? 
But I happen to have a German professor who made it even more boring than it could be. One day I was at the top of the lecture hall and I looked down and literally everyone in the lecture hall was asleep. There were a couple people that actually had their head tilted back and their mouth open like this. Okay. The guy was brilliant, brilliant German professor, but it was just blah, blah, blah. And what, what the Bible says is that if we don't have love, even if we had the tongues of men and of angels, it's just blah, blah, blah. We're just like Gert Ehrlich. I still remember his name. Teaching metallurgical thermodynamics. If we don't have love. We could, verse 2, have prophetic powers, discerning mysteries, and all knowledge. We could have all the spiritual insight in the world and all kinds of knowledge, but they fail to bring any meaning without love. Prophetic powers, can you imagine what it would be like to have all prophetic powers? That is, you would know the future perfectly. Now, some of us would go, at least would be wise enough to know, you know, I don't want to know everything in the future. <laughs> There's probably some bad things ahead that I really would prefer not to know ahead of time. Those of you that are investment-oriented may be really excited about the idea but the Bible says you could have all prophetic powers. If you don't have love, you are not just something, you are nothing. Did you catch that word at the end of verse 2? Nothing. You could discern mysteries. You could have all knowledge. You could be the person that everybody goes to and they ask the questions of the meaning of the universe and all of their difficult questions and you could give wonderful, eloquent answers, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. Absolutely meaningless. You could have faith of such a supernatural evidence that you could remove mountains, but it means nothing without love. Verse 3, you could have a generosity of the highest order. That is, take all you have and give it all away, and it will be of no credit to you if you do not have love. Sacrifice, end of verse 3, if you deliver up your body to be burned, you're even the ultimate sacrifice of giving one's life for Christ gains nothing without love. So, you can be either brilliant or miraculously mystical in your words, and it matters nothing. Sounding good <laughs> does not really matter. You can be right about everything. <clears throat> and boy, we live in a world, the 21st century America, where being right is a really big deal, isn't it? Did you know you can be right about everything and not succeed in your mission on earth as a Christian? You could exercise the greatest faith in God that the world has ever seen and even get results from God for that faith. The mountains are moved. But even then, you are meaningless and have accomplished nothing. Have you ever seen someone who does not get thrilled when they hear of success or great news? You know, some great success or great news happens and they're just kind of like, meh. Now, some people, that's because they just don't show emotion very much, and that's fine. God makes different people different ways. But sometimes the reason why a person is not truly thrilled by success or great news is that the person is lacking in love. The failure to, in, 
enjoy, the joys of life in large part is due to a failure to love. Now, some people have not been trained to love because they've had some horrible circumstances in their upbringing. Some have never been trained to express love. But all of us can grow in our capacity to enjoy the gracious gift of life and the joy of others as we embrace the biblical definition of love. You could give all your money away and it will be of no credit to you without love. You can give the last full measure of devotion to Christ, even giving your life for the gospel, but you gain nothing from that without love. So, spiritual virtues of all kinds are meaningless. You catch that? Meaningless without love, and that's an absolute. Meaningless without love. So, if love is that important, then the next really good question to ask is, what is love? (laughs) If we got to have that in order to have anything have any meaning, tell me what love is. And Paul says, I'm glad you asked. Love is an others-oriented commitment. Love is an others-oriented commitment. Others-oriented first, commitment to God, and then to others. Love is an others-oriented commitment. So, in verse 4, we see what love is. Love is patient and kind. That is, biblical love makes allowances. It's patient. It's willing to keep working with people and situations even when there has been failure on the other person's part. That's why you can be right and still miss it in terms of meaning, because love is patient even when there is failure on the other person's part. You keep working with people and situations. Love is kind. That's the capacity to see what you would want in that situation, and then to give it. Kindness means pulling out of your own self and looking at the situation from the other person's point of view, and then giving them what you know they would want or what God would want for them. That's kindness, pulling out of yourself into the other person's shoes. Love is patient love is kind. That's what love is. Now, let's look at the next few verses, and we'll find out what love is not. This love is neither selfish nor proud. It does not envy or boast. This word translated envy or selfish is an orientation that's always asking, how is this person or this situation affecting me? (laughs) It's that orientation that's selfish. Love is an orientation that always asks, how is this situation or I am affecting my neighbor? The word that's translated boast is a word that describes pride. It's an orientation that says, I'm right, I know that I'm right, and nothing will ever change me from my opinion. Love is an orientation that says, even though I am right, I will not throw my rightness in my neighbor's face. I will be open to the possibilities of God-empowered breakthroughs. Love does not envy or boast. End of verse 4, beginning of verse 5, love is not arrogant or rude. The word arrogant means not puffed up. Again, it's this self-centered focus that is not love. And this is very hard for us to get away from because we are inhabiting our own selves and it's hard for us to jump out of ourselves. You, you realize how hard that is, right? It's hard. We, 
May I suggest even the word impossible? We'll get to that in a minute. But love is not arrogant or rude. This word rude carries with it the idea of indecent. That is, having some secret hidden agenda of manipulation. There's a lot of people that say, oh, I love you, but then they're stabbing you in the back along the way, right? Love, real love, is genuine and guileless. It carries no hidden agendas. You know, there are people who use the language of love in order to get their way. That's rude. That's indecent. Whether it's seduction, people use the words of love to get what they want from someone physically, or abuse, being able to, by their words, manipulate people to do their bidding, or simply manipulation. Love is not puffed up or indecent, rude in that way. Next, verse 6, or excuse me, end of verse 5. Love is not irritable, or excuse me, let me back up. It does not insist on its own way. This literally means love does not seek its own. It's a commitment to another that is greater than one's commitment to one's own pleasure. It's greater than one's commitment to one's own comfort. You're not insisting on your own way, but looking out for what would be the best way for the one that is the object of your love. It is not irritable. That means no long-term bitterness. Have you ever been in a situation where you've just given and given and given, and the person just seems to receive it and just, just use you? We're strongly tempted in those situations, aren't we? to say, that's it, I'm done. Love doesn't do that. There's no long-term bitterness in biblical love. It says also love is not resentful. This word has to do with calculation. Love does not calculate. It doesn't calculate the bad things, keeping a record and making calculations. Okay, here's what they've done wrong, and here's what I've done wrong, and we'll make a calculation, and I'm a little bit better than they are, and we're always a little bit better than they are, aren't we, (laughs) in our own calculation. Love doesn't calculate. It's just purely giving. Verse 6 Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It finds no joy in evil. Have you ever seen someone that you are in a relationship with who does something and it turns out wrong and it goes bad and you're inside kind of happy that it went bad? You think, oh, good, they're getting theirs. That's not love. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Delighting in evil, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, doesn't delight in evil, means that we know what evil is and we call it what it is. You're not denying that evil doesn't exist. Love is not blind in the sense that you don't see what's real. It's despite knowing the reality of the truth, you press on in this others-oriented commitment. Rejoicing with the truth means you know what the truth is, and you call it what it is. And even though you're criticized, you rejoice with the truth. So, what love is, it's patient and kind what it's not, not envious or boastful, arrogant, rude, insisting on its own way, not irritable or resentful, doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Beginning in verse 7, Paul now goes to what love does. So, we talked about what it is, what it's not. Now, let's look at what love does. Love 
bears all things. It endures, even when it's unpleasant or displeasing. And, you know, I'll tell you the convicting part of this verse is the repeated all things. You kind of go, wait a minute, can it just be some things? Can it just be, you know, the things that I like? Can it just be after a while you're done? Love endures even when it is unpleasant or displeasing. The issue is not good things, not a few bad things, but all things. Here's what this means, brothers and sisters. This means that love is not only uncomfortable at times, but to truly love is downright painful. It's painful to love that way. Love believes all things. It gives trust, even when trust is not evidenced. Love, therefore, always opens a person up to being wounded and hurt. When you really love in a biblical way, you're just saying, here I am, and you know that you're opening yourself up to being hurt. Love hopes all things. Love holds on to the idea that a good future lies ahead. It means that you plan for success, not for failure. Sometimes out of our desperation to control things, we will, thinking that we're loving someone, plan for their failure. Now, when they fail this way, this is how I'll respond. We do those kind of calculations. Love hoping all things means that you don't do that, but rather you think in terms of the person's success, not their failure, and you seek to help that to happen. Love endures all things. It doesn't pretend that hard things won't come. Hard things will. Love is honest enough to admit that trial and disappointment are guaranteed to come, but love also perseveres and holds fast no matter what. And how Paul concludes it is in verse 8, love never ends, never fails. Now, verses 8 to 13, there's many kinds of spiritual virtues that have come and will disappear, but love is the greatest abiding virtue. So, verse 8, prophecy and knowledge are going to pass away. You see it as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for knowledge, end of verse 8, it will pass away. So, this is the same word, pass away, that's used in both of those. Prophecy and knowledge have always been limited, and we don't get the completion of either of those in this life. In the glorified life, verse 10, that partialness also will pass away. Same word, pass away, verse 10. When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So, prophecy and knowledge, they're going to stop. They're going to pass away. And in the new creation, the glorified life, then all of the partial things will pass away. Now, in the middle there, it says tongues, and we'll talk more about this next week, but it's a different word that's used here. As for tongues, they will cease. That is, that they're just going to stop on their own. We'll talk about that more next week. But the point is, is that these virtues that are involved with the spiritual gifts that are mentioned in chapter 12, they're not forever they will disappear permanently with maturity. And Paul is describing the work of the body of Christ to a human body. And notice the comparison. He says, when I was a human child, when I was a human child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became mature, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Uh, Some virtues are designed for children. 
Others are designed for adults. Speaking and thinking and reasoning are all different for children versus adults. And maturity means that we set aside, or they are set aside for us, childish ways. And according to verse 12, the new creation is going to be a place where our dim understandings will be transformed into complete understanding. We will know as fully as God knows us. I want you to think about that for a second because I love the illustration he gives of a mirror. You look in a mirror and let's say it's all cloudy and kind of old and you look at it and you can't really tell that much about your features, but then face to face with the Lord Jesus, you know as fully as you are fully known. Have you ever asked this? I've said this before. You know, when I get to heaven, one of the questions I'm going to ask is, and you fill in dot, 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 right? I'm going to guess that that's not going to be what happens. I think that when we get to heaven, we see Jesus face to face. We're going to go, oh, (laughs) aha, right? Then face to face, I'll know as fully as I am fully known. What a beautiful picture. Now, this will impact the are thinking about spiritual gifts, as we will get into next week in chapter 14. But what we need to know for now is this. Love is a greater virtue than any spiritual gift. No matter how dramatic or supernatural that gift may be, love is more important than any spiritual gift. Secondly, some gifts do disappear, especially with the time of maturing. The maturity of the church is being paralleled here with the maturity of a person, and we can't discount that comparison. And we'll be thinking about church history next week and how the church matures. The argument that's sometimes been made of the perfect coming in verse uh, 10, when the perfect comes… Some people have suggested that when the perfect comes is God's completed Word. That does not seem to me to be a very sound argument because in verse 12, it's the coming of the new creation that's in view. And so, it seems like it's a better idea to think of the perfect coming being the new creation coming. It's probably not the perfect one being Jesus because the grammatic gender in Greek is not something that would be referred to Jesus as. Uh, The noun is actually in the neuter gender in Greek grammatically. So, my guess is that what verse 10 is talking about is the new creation comes. When the new creation comes, the partial will be done away. And right now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, then in the new creation we will see face to face. I think that a biblical and historical case can be made for the cessation of sign gifts in the church, but we'll look at that in detail next week. For now, notice how Paul concludes this beautiful chapter. There are three virtues that abide, that last forever, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, I want to think about this in three areas of application. First, how it applies to marriages. Secondly, how it applies to the church, our church life. And thirdly, how it may apply to each one of us as individuals. Let me begin this discussion of application by saying, have you, as we read this, come to the conclusion, well, that's impossible? I hope you have because I hope you've come to a… Well, you're arguing with the text. You're saying, it can't possibly mean that, Scott. That you're going, but you don't know this person. You don't know this situation. How could this possibly… And my answer to you is this. This is what the text means. This is what biblical love is. And we, 
find it impossible to attain it. And that's right where God wants us, at a spot where we are powerless. And so as believers in Jesus Christ, what we pray for, Lord, empower me to love like this. Empower me to love like this. All right, let's think about it in terms of marriage. You know, there's a whole bunch of areas that get where marriage goes, marriages go off, off, the, off the rails. Uh, first is overcommitment and physical exhaustion. People just get wrapped up in life and they just go in a million miles an hour and they're, they're tired, physically tired. They're not getting enough sleep. And out of that, all of a sudden come wounds and hurts and accounts get longer, discussions get shorter, things get more abrupt, and all of a sudden you find yourself very distant. A second way in which marriage goes wrong is indebtedness and money conflicts. Those kinds of pressures cause people to behave and act in ways that are not in seeking the other person's best. A a big area is simple selfishness, like we talked about before. It's hard to get outside yourself and think, how can I put myself in my partner's shoes and show them the love that God wants them to experience? Another one is interference from the broader family, particularly from in-laws, where people feel the, the weight of just trying to figure out what it means to leave father and mother and be united to their spouse. Another problem in marriage is unrealistic expectations. If you were marrying someone thinking that they were going to be like Jesus to you, you will be disappointed because they don't turn out to be very much like Jesus at all. And it hurts. Sometimes in marriage there's attempts to control and manipulate. That is, out of using the language of love, they're using that language in order to get their partner to do what they want them to do. That's a formula for disaster in a marriage. There's all kinds of vices that can grab people that destroy marriages, alcohol and substance abuse, gambling, pornography, and may I add digital device addictions can all interfere with the thriving of a love relationship in marriage. Loneliness and sexual frustration, business failure or business success can all lead to real distance in marriage. This morning, what I want to ask you couples is, as I went through that list, to say, well, what are the areas in our marriage that we see those things, the seeds of those things happening? Or maybe there's something that I didn't mention. And then to talk about that as a couple, and then to pray and say, even to read this passage out loud with one another and pray your way through it, to say, Lord, not, <laughs> I'm not going to pray, Lord, help Carol be patient and kind. Wrong approach. Lord, help me, empower me to be patient and kind. Help me not to envy or boast. Help me not to be arrogant or rude or irritable or resentful or insisting on my own way. I need your power. That's the only way it's going to work. Now, this is true not just in marriage, but it's also true in the church, right? To be able to focus off of ourselves and onto Christ and others, to be committed to your church. By the way, when you think of the church, don't think of a building, don't think of just some uh, ethereal entity. Think of people. What does it mean to be committed to the people in your church? To ask the Lord, Lord, give me such power to identify that love is an others-oriented commitment in the church, to offer yourself to your church body. And, 
and to try not to take offense when you are sinned against in your church. You know why? Because I can guarantee you, you will be sinned against. You will be sinned against in your church. Doesn't matter what church you go to, you will be sinned against. <clears throat> you know why I know that? Because the only people that are in this church or any other church are sinners. That's it. Redeemed, but sinners. So we look for opportunities then. We look around for opportunities to show this 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Not come looking for, well, who's going to love me in a 1 Corinthians 13 way, but rather, how can I show that love to others? And then the last one is one I've really wrestled with uh, over the years, to recognize that when that kind of love is hard to do, it's because maybe what God's wanting is to shape me to become more like His Son than He's interested in getting me the justice that I think I deserve. God's more interested in some whatever difficult circumstance that I'm having with someone. He's wanting me to become more like Jesus than He is to prove that I'm right and the other person's wrong. <laughs> Last area of application, to be able to say of ourselves individually, I can't know love apart from knowing how God loves. And how did God love us? You see, this is why we need to teach the gospel to ourselves every day. If I don't understand God's love for me that is exactly like this, it's patient, it's kind, it doesn't envy or boast, it's not arrogant or rude, it doesn't insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, aren't you glad God doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, at going, no, 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 you're another wrong one you did, but instead He rejoices with the truth, He bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. His love never fails. It never fails. And the only way we can embrace this kind of love for others is when we first recognize this is God's love for me. This is how He loves. And so, if you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin by what He did at the cross, may I offer that to you this morning? To say to God right now, God, I need to experience Your love in a supernatural way. I know You sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sin, and I am trusting Him right now to forgive me of my sin and to give me His life. His power, and that His love will be at work through me. And then for those of you who know Jesus, it's not enough to have heard that message and to have embraced it a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, forty years ago, sixty years ago. Not enough. You got to tell yourself that every day. I'm a recipient of the absolute wonderful miraculous, unceasing, forever love of God in Christ. And now, God, You have given me this mission to show that same kind of love to other people who are just as undeserving as I am of Your love. By Your power, God, enable me so to do that. Let's pray. God, we ask You to do that work of grace in each heart. Help those who've never put their faith in Christ to do that. For those who have, to remind themselves of this gospel message of Your love for us. We do pray that You would empower, empower us to love this way. Bless the marriages that are represented here in this room. Help them to overcome 
the challenges that are, are very evident right now, and for those marriages that are hanging on by a thread, oh God, would you bring a refreshment, a refreshing downpour of your love upon each one. Now, God, we would pray that you would help us to love in our church the way that you want us to. We can't imagine what it would be like if every church in America just started loving each other like this. It would be transforming of our culture, and so we pray you'd begin that work of revival in our own hearts, in our own church, so to love one another. And God, we pray this not for our own glory, but that the world would know about your love that you expressed in Christ. In His name we pray, amen. Just a few quick announcements before we're dismissed this morning. Welcome guests. We'd love it if you text EWOBC to 77411 and stop by the Welcome Center right over there to pick up a small gift. It's coffee. It's good. Pastor Scott would also enjoy meeting you in the Connections Room down the long hallway to the right by the gym after this service. A reminder for each of us to update your information for the new church directory being prepared later this summer, so you can take out your phones or do it later. And go to eastwhiteoak.church, touch the hamburger menu at the top, Select Oak Central, scroll down, and under quick link, select the church photo directory form, and then fill out your information and click submit. Would you like me to go through those slides again? <laughs> nope? Good? Okay. Next week on Sunday the 28th, you can explore the variety of ways that people serve here at East White Oak at Volunteer, also down in the Connections Room at both 9 and 1030. And speaking of serving, perhaps the greatest need at the moment is for men and women to invest in the spiritual nurture of children on Sunday mornings this summer with our Cruisin' with Paul program for kids. Stop by the table in the hallway to find out more. In fact, Beth Fromey, our children's director, came to RABF last week to make one more plea. So if you're able to serve in this capacity this summer, please see her. If you aren't yet receiving the e-bulletin every Thursday, click the Oak Central button at the church's homepage, eastwhiteoak.church, and scroll to the link that says, appropriately, sign up for the e-bulletin. And lastly, one of the three T's of our worship is with our treasure. So if you came prepared to joyfully give this morning, you can use the connection boxes located at the exits. I feel like I'm on a flight crew, right? Or you can opt to use our online giving platform at eastwhiteoak.church. Just click on the Give tab. Now stand with us as we sing, Come people of the risen King who delight to give Him praise. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. Have a blessed Lord's Day.